wah, wah. Choose your vibration, choose your reality. What do you observe? Yeah. Shallow tribe up. Yeah, man. What's the reality? Choose your Joshua and choose up. Because it's all relative. It's all relative, man. Zeus or Isus. Breaking the British Druid magic spell at last. We're talking about breaking the spell. We're talking about energy, frequency, vibration. We're talking about thought spell barriers. We're talking about Zeus and Ra and Atlantis and Hijack 101. All the same energy. Celestial hijack. According to the Holy Bible, Satan's kingdom is hierarchical. And the evil one assigns the most powerful demons to rule over the various nations daniel the prophet saw all this in the vision given to him specifically by hawa then he hawa said do you know why i have come to you and now i must return to fight with the prince of persia and when i have gone forth lo the prince of greece will come daniel 10 and 20 after his stoning at Lystra, St. Paul had a global view of the stationary earth when he was caught up to the third heaven. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now that's in their hijack, right? Because we're just talking about the New Test. We're just talking about the story and the chronology and the foundational legend. So the most powerful of Satan's principalities is called Zeus. The most powerful of Satan's principalities is called Zeus. Pay attention because this is going to play. Wakey, wakey. Because we love our people and it's time to break the spell. The magic spell. It's time to break the spell. You have to wake up now and come out of her. You worship Satan, you worship Baal, you worship these energies. They're in the fabric of this illusion. They're in the fabric of the incorporation of things. The holidays are corporate holy days. And they have you in a cycle, in a spell. You do it every year. You won't break the spell, the magic that is holding you in captivity. You don't think it's real. But your slavery is real because you don't have your land, Negro. The most powerful of Satan's principalities is called Zeus or the Prince of Greece. Zeus plays second fiddle to nobody, not even Jupiter. Satan's demons have different names in different countries. Zeus is the head demon in the Greek hierarchy. In Britannia, the head demon is called Esus. Huh? Zeus is Isus. Remember, there is no J, so your Jesus is only Isus. <laughs> Come on, choose your Joshua. Zeus is the head demon of the Greek hierarchy in Britannia. The head demon is called Isus, second fiddle to nobody, Lucifer. Zeus and Isus are always demand bloody human sacrifices so when they brought over their isus what happened to you so-called negro it was a bloody sacrifice because their god of war isus or jesus or isus or zeus or hell zeus isus is hell zeus demands bloody human sacrifice and they say that you were into that huh but they came over here literally sacrificing you to their god, Isus. In Egypt, the old serpent appeared everywhere, even on Pharaoh's crown, where he was known by the name Abun Ra. 
Amun Ra is the equivalent of Zeus. Amun Ra is the equivalent of Zeus in Egypt and India. Shiva is the equivalent of the Greek Zeus. So you have the Shiva Zeus here, you have the Ra Zeus here. It's all about the sun disk. Because you know now that the sun is only 32 miles in diameter. It's not some huge gigantic ball of gas. It's only 32 miles in diameter. Shining like a flashlight only 3,000 miles above you. Shining and doing a circuit. Is it a portal? I mean, you only see one side of it just like the moon. Are these portals? Are they discs? I mean, they got their own different light sources, opposite properties. So every nation of antiquity had their supreme false god who was the equivalent of Amun-Ra or Zeus or Isus or Isus. Rock with me. Let's get this first. Isus. I mean, we are decapitating all hijacks because we came to devour their authority over this chaos. And if you're not here to devour the authority of chaos, if you're not here to resist chaos and to, you know what I'm saying, surf the wave and flow with that, which is the phi, the natural spiral, you're, you're surfing the spiral, baby. You're surfing all the probabilities. You don't have to be stuck beneath the barrier with the celestial hijack E Zeus. E Zeus, Zeus, S U S means swine in Greek. Would your creator name his son Swine? S U S, Zeus, Zeus. Hey Zeus, you think that is Kowinky Dink? Wake up, nigga! Every Sunday you're in church, the Sunday, Babylonian first day of the week, the same pagan, same pagan heathen worship, the same Sunday, your Shabbat is no more, right? Now, for some reason, the Sabbath is the busiest day of the week. All Timmy's basketball practice is on Saturday. This rehearsal is on Saturday. These niggas got to do this. These people got to sell on Saturday. This party's popping. Everything's on Saturday, right? During the week. Oh, man. It's during, you know, it's the weekday. Sunday. Oh, man. You know, I'm probably going to go to church, lay low. Saturday. Man, just straight up profane, profane. No one falls back. So when you start falling back, you get on another grid, on another geometrical grid. We're just talking Jesus, man. Look, this might be a two, three, four part series, man. I mean, hey, I'm just I'm just surfing the wave, man. I'm just flowing with that ruwa. You know, I just got a bunch of drops written out of head. I always, you know, I'm like, I got this drop, man, I'm gonna get to this, but most I said decapitate these hijacks, that's what I'm gonna do. So let's go. Isus, he sus, Esus, Asus was a Gaulish god known from two Monumental statues and a line of Lucan Bellum Seville. All right. The two sculptures were Isus, where Isus appears. All right, this is Isus right here. Let's see if I can. Let's see, here we go. All right. So you got Isus right here. All right. Hopefully, you can get that. Hey, man, I'll leave the link, man. All right. So he got this dagger in his hand. He's look like he's cutting something. Let's see what they say, man. Let's see what they say. They said the two sculptures where Isus appears are the pillars of the boatman from among the par Parisi, Parisi on which Isus is identified by name and a pillar from Trier among the Treveri with similar iconic, iconic, iconography, iconography. In both of these, Isus is portrayed cutting branches from trees. In both of these, Esau, Isus, Jesus, Christmas, Christmas, 
tree, cut down the tree. In both of these, Jesus is portrayed cutting branches from trees with his axe. Jesus is accompanied on different panels on the pillar of boatman by Tarvos Tregaranas, the bull with the three cranes, Jupiter. Ah, what is his relationship with Jupiter? Are we talking about Lucifer and his son, Satan and his son? I said Satan and his son, Christ, Jesus, Jesus, Zeus. Let's get it. Jupiter, Vulcan, and other gods. So he's cutting it down. And somewhere it said uh, they had a reference to the tree of life, which was interesting. So he's cutting down the tree of life. Or now you got every Christmas, they're cutting down Christmas trees. Maybe symbolic of them cutting down the tree of life, right? That sounds about right. Because we're just talking Eosus. Here we go. Jesus, Zeus, Hell, Zeus, Jesus, Hell, Zeus, Hell, Zeus. Get it? Source Dictionary of Christian Lore and Legend. Source Jesus is Hell, Zeus. There is no J, right? Defaming the Christ with the pagan name, replacing his Hebrew name with a pagan Greek name that honors a pagan God, the Messiah's true name. So, you know, they're probably surfing the wave that. Yeah, well, you know, they're just putting another name on it, but we about to get the job that they're just creating all this story up and just linking in the foundation, which you're calling Old Testament, which is more recent than you think. They're adding a thousand years to the damn timeline. Why did they add a thousand years to the timeline? Why did they push it back that far so that they can fit in their story? Now you're Joshua, you're Joshua. Your Joshua that led you to your promised land gets pushed back a thousand years to fit in this Christos who said, I'm going to come back in a couple thousand years, man, but I'm going to leave y'all in Roman Greek captivity. Peace. But you're Joshua. <laughs> Under Hawamak. We're talking about Kitsukoto. We're about to get it. Man, we're talking about the foundational legend, man. I mean, where are they getting this stuff from? Where are they getting a story from? He is Zeus. Hail Zeus. Originally, the name of the Messiah was pronounced. You know, they're going to get into the Yahushua. Yahushua. They're just talking Joshua. So they're just basically saying Joshua. Now, if that story is being hijacked, then it goes a little deeper than just changing a name. Because they changed the entire personality of this thing. They changed the entire complexion. I mean, suddenly you got this Joshua popping up with 12 disciples. But you can go back in Joshua chapter 3, verse 12. Now, therefore, take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man. And it shall come to pass that as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Hawa, the the, the creator of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan. So this Joshua also was commanded to have 12 men out of every tribe. Out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man. You think it's play play when you have to deal with your chronology? Remember we got this before about the uh, added chronology, man. I just leave the link. Of course, all this is in the drive library, man. Man, what y'all do is that, man. We got into the, uh, let's see if we can get it. Yeah, man. Oh, you know, peace and power to drop nation, man. They've been, you know what I'm saying? These are hard to find joints, man. So, you know, y'all be patient with me, man, because there's so much great stuff coming in and it flows at the right time, man. That's all we can do. Man, we're just talking modern chronology. I want to get back into that Mongol yoke. One of these went into the, uh, the actual, the actual astronomy, man. I'm gonna try this one here. Thirty-nine.
Man. Oh, they getting into the crack, man. I mean, they getting right into it, man. <laughs> they getting right into it. Man. I forgot how good this was. You know, I get excited. All right. Oh, yeah. We're just talking about the Scaligarian chronology, man. We're just talking about, I mean, this stuff has a title for a reason. This does, you know, this was all put on you for a reason. Oh man, all right, all right, wow, a wow, wow. You know, we literally belly flopped and found exactly what we we're looking for, man. So, uh, praise the wild, man. We're surfing the wave, man. I did not expect it like that. We're just talking Anatoly for the Manco, and we're about to get into all of what you're about to get here. Now, this is a another substantiating source breaking down this chronology. This Anatoly for the Manco, this Russian chronographer, putting it together again. Showing that everything has been, you know, saying duplicated and all these phantoms are popping up in your history. So Anatoly Fomenko also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 AD, the so-called fundamental shift of 1053 years in the chronology. I told you they added time, nigga, naga. We talking dragons and shit. Man, we about to get it. We're talking Khan dynasties and dragons, man. It gets real. Anatoly from Manco also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 AD, the so-called fundamental shift of 1053, 1053 years is the shift, my people. And the chronology is implied as year one in accordance with Christ's birth. So the year 1054 A.D. is implied as year one. <laughs> so if 1054 is actually the real year one. Implying that some shift happened or some mark or sign happened. And now you're looking right here in America. And who was born around 1054. You're getting right back into Joshua and when you get into Joshua you're getting right into Kitsukoto who they called the priest king that led his people to the promised land we're talking about the Toltecs man let the Paco man dropping this on us man as Shu and Anhar in Egyptian mythology and Moses and Joshua conduct their people with the solar orb around the circle of signs overcoming the opposing powers postulated in the early by the early men so in Toltec Toltec mythology or reality Hawa Ma and Kitsukoto conducted their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in their picture writings Hawa Ma like Moses Moshi Meshi Meshiko wrote the code of laws for the nation so Moses Hawamak wrote the codes of laws, code of laws for the nation, and conducted the civil government. Kitsukoto, in relation to Hawamak, plays the part of Joshua. So, Gerald Massey, in the book of the beginnings, is making the link between this Moses foundational legend and Hawamak, the lawgiver, who passed his laws to Kitsukoto or Joshua. Who led you to your promised land right here, nigga. And this happened around this. When? What are we talking about? I'm just talking about my Neguses and my Negush. My Kings. My Naga. My <laughs> oh, man. I'm talking energy, frequency, vibration. We're talking chronology. 1054. The so-called fundamental shift of 10, 1053 years. And chronology is implied as year one in accordance with Christ's birth. This means that the medieval chroniclers often dated the birth of Christ precisely to 1054. 1054. Incidentally, the start of the first crusade for the liberation of the Holy Scepture is dated 1096. 
So now you got this crusade popping off. About 40 years after the birth of this mark or this sign or this seed of noon, seed of none. This seed, this Joshua, this Joshua, that what? Now therefore take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe, a man. Man, we're about to get to some good stuff, man. Relax, man, fall back. I'm just flowing, man, flowing with y'all. Remember this document, all this is being dropped on you, man. Click the links below. We're talking kids of cult to Jesus Christ. What they did, what the Mormons did was link Joshua here. And they linked this Joshua directly with who they're calling Jesus Christ. Who they call kids of cult to. We're talking about the fiery dragon, the fiery flying dragon or serpent. Moses' staff turning into a flying, fiery dragon. Moses' staff. You're talking about a, a, a energetic, you know what I'm saying, beyond the barrier. We're talking about a Khan dynasty. You're talking about the serpent devouring the venomous snakes. The venomous snakes. A serpent devouring the venomous snakes. You are that which devours. You are Shalom. You devour Shin, Shin, devouring, Shin. You are that which devours. So, excerpt from Ancient America, the Book of Mormon, Milton R. Hunter. Click the link, man. Let's get it from right here. In Mexico's great central mesa, where Ixil Coquitil <laughs> lived, the name by which the fair god of the ancient America of ancient America was generally known as Quetzalcoatl. To right, Kitz, Quetzal was the name of the beautiful bird with the resplendent long green feathers and the dainty crest. Coatl is the ancient my is the ancient Mexican word for serpent. Thus, the name Quetzalcoatl literally means Quetzal bird serpent. Devouring the venomous snakes. Let's get it. Kitsukota was the name applied to the New World God, which means, you know, they just call it new because obviously they're just getting here or they're referring to their New World Order. Either way, we know we're talking America. So Kitsukota was the name applied to the American God who was in the form of a man, bearded, white robed, a great teacher. Bearded, white robed, and a great teacher of moral principles. We're talking about a man. We're talking about Joshua, Hawashua, a great teacher of moral principles. In the form of a man, bearded with a white robe, a great teacher of moral principle. The Koltu or serpent was an ancient symbol of Israel's Messiah, the anointed one. The call to our serpent was an ancient symbol of Israel's Messiah, the anointed one. I mean, we're about to get into this drop. And we're just talking Caesar's Messiah. So how do we get from Israel's Messiah to Caesar's Messiah? How do we get from Joshua with 12 disciples? Now, therefore, take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man, Joshua, and do your work, man. We're talking about the shift of 1053 years in chronology my people which is actually year one in accordance with so-called christ or the messiah's birth which one because if they added it to fit in theirs that means the real one was born in 1053 which means that we might just be talking about israel's messiah Kuoto. gets a Kuoto. moses's Moses, man, Moses raised serpent staff symbol was preserved by Israel for over 500 years. And it's clearly identified with who they're calling Jehovah slash Christ. Nah, man. <laughs> We're talking Hawa. They're hijacking you with Christ, Jehovah, Jesus, or Jesus, hell Zeus, Jesus, Zeus. 
Jesus. Zeus is the head demon of Greek, but of the Greek hierarchy. The head demon is called Jesus. Zeus and Jesus always demand bloody human sacrifice. We're talking Ra. We're talking Thoth. We're talking the Thoth spell barrier. We're talking about breaking the spell, man. We're talking about breaking the magic spell, man. Of Zeus. What Messiah? The Messiah's true name. What is the Messiah's true name? If we're only talking year one and that's actually 1054. Then when was this Moses' raised serpent staff symbol was preserved by Israel for over 500 years? When is this? Clearly identified with Christ or the Mashiach. Man. We're just talking Joshua. We're just talking Joshua and Kitsukotu. Toltec mythology, Hawa Mak and Kitsukotu conduct their people through their pilgrimage and wanderings. Recorded in their picture writings, Hawa Mak, like Moses, wrote the code of laws for the nation and conducted the civil government. Kitsukotu, in relation to Hawa Mak, plays the part of Joshua. Kitsukotu is Joshua. Kitsukotu is... Israel's Messiah, the Anointed One, who also said he'll be back. And this is the one they fear because this is the warrior version. The warrior version. See, there's two different versions of this thing. And you got to choose your Joshua. And I'm saying you better choose up. Because you don't got long. You better choose up. Because we're just talking crosses, man. Oh, yeah, we're going to get... Oh, man. Yeah, man, it's about to get good to y'all, man. It's about to get good. We're just talking crosses. I mean, this ain't the only one. All right, I know it's kind of hard. You know, you got to stare at this for a minute, but you see the cross in the back, right? You see that crisscross? This is Kids Golto on the cross. Joshua on the cross. But is he on the cross being crucified? Is he just a symbol for the Tao, the Tao, the Tao, the sign, the sign of the sun of noon? I mean, we're just talking crosses, man. You know? This is even smaller, but you know. Now, that's the same one, but it's in color, so you can clearly see the cross right there. And they make these small on purpose, man. You know, but you got this cross popping up all over the place, man. So, you know, when we digging on it, man, we saying choose up. It is what it is now. Right before we get, uh, you know, into the Caesar's Messiah, when that say Jesus, you know what I'm saying? When this drive right here says, man, right in your face bone, Zeus is the head demon of the Greek hierarchy. In Britannia, the head demon is called Isus. Zeus and Isus always demand bloody human sacrifice. You're talking about the connection. You're talking about the Zeus and Isus. You're talking about... <laughs> you're talking about Isus or Jesus. 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 Cutting down the tree of life. Christmas tree. All right. <laughs> All right. So the Messiah's name is actually the same as Joshua, son of Nun. So, you know, they're trying to hang on to this New Test version, but still they got to admit that originally the name of the Messiah was pronounced when they said Yahushua. All right. We're just talking Joshua. Hawashua. This is the Messiah's original name. The Messiah's name is actually the same name as Joshua. Son of Nun. We're talking about the sprouting seed. All right, man. But they're just talking about Jesus. They're just talking about Zeus. And what do they say in their closed doors? I mean, how many of y'all are attending these services these days? So what are they really saying behind closed doors? 
flaming Lucifer. This is them saying it. I'm just going to read this part. I'm going to let them sing it to you. Flaming Lucifer finds mankind. I say, O oh Lucifer, who will never be defeated. Christ is your son. This is what they're about to sing to you in Latin. This is what they're singing amongst each other in Latin. I'm not making this shit up. This ain't play play. If you didn't believe none of the links, if you thought all that shit was bullshit and you're still holding on to Christ or you think you got a different version of Christ or you think you got a Hebrew version of Christ and you're still hanging on to this story and not connecting yourself to the indigenous octoctan, to your Hawashu Hawa who literally drove the Canaanites off your land here in so-called America. And you don't comprehend that they flipped it all and put everything over there and gave it duplicates and added time to the timelines to fit this motherfucker in. Then let them sing this shit to you. Flaming Lucifer finds mankind. I say, O oh Lucifer, who will never be defeated. Christ is your son who came back from hell. You're talking Isus. Son of Satan, Zeus, son of Satan, shed his peaceful light and is alive and reigns in the world without end. Christ is your son. Christ is your son, O Lucifer, who will never be defeated. Christ is your son. That's fact. Why else do you think there's a church on every corner, nigga? Why else would they go so hard to hijack you? What is your theology schools all really about? It's about the spell. You teach them, they'll teach their people. They'll poison their people with Zeus, with the son of Lucifer. Huh? Oh, Lucifer, who will never be defeated. Christ is your son. Hear it for yourself. Oh, hold up, man. <laughs> I should probably keep that. Doing a little powwow, man. Don't mind, don't mind us, man. Sometimes we gotta have the powwow going to uh, counter some of this hijack uh, frequency, man. Hear it for yourself, man. All right. In a few moments, the Pope's deacon invokes Lucifer, Satan, during the pagan Easter vigil, Mass 2012, man. Translation: the translation of the passage. Christ is your son, Lucifer. In case y'all, you know, I want to make sure y'all can read it, man. All right. Everybody see this nice and clear. Because Drop ain't making this shit up. Oh, Lucifer, who will never be defeated. Christ is your son. I don't even like to hear this shit. So I'll leave you the link. They're singing it. They're telling you. What are they telling you? <laughs> They're telling you is Zeus. Jesus is Helling Zeus. The son of Satan. Is Zeus cutting down the tree of life. Every Christmas you're worshiping it. Halloween, whatever you want to call it. You're talking is Zeus. Satan's demons have different names in different countries. 
Zeus is the head demon of the Greek hierarchy. In Britannia, the head demon is called Jesus or Jesus or Jesus. Now, what's the story created and why did they add a thousand years to your timeline? Anatoly Fedomenko also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 AD, the so-called fundamental shift of 1053 years in chronology is applied as year one. In accordance with Christ's birth or the Mashiach's birth, year one. What sign? What are they recording? Why was this a new beginning of Joshua's birth? Why was it a new beginning for you? So we're going to jump into it, man. That's just the intro of this quick series, man. Let's get it, man. Man, love to uh, my man Vic. My man Vic. My man Vic Mac. You know, this all comes from you, man. I was, you know, I'm, I'm on a whole other thing that you might... You might slap me in the side bone or something, man. I'm like, man, I got to dig on that, man. Victor Mack, King Drop, your scholarship, attention to detail, the insight is impeccable, man. Hawa, Hawa, man, Drop Nation is impeccable, my brother. Uh, delighted to surf the wave with your listeners and you. Are you familiar with Joseph Atwill's book entitled Caesar's Messiah, man? We got to get that PDF, my people. Sticky fingers, Caesar's Messiah. The author presents a compelling argument that Christianity, Jesus, and Gospels were a creation of, Ro of Roman political literature. So Jesus and the Gospels were a creation of Roman political literature. A lot was created out of Roman political literature. I mean, hey, even the creation of the Prophet Muhammad, the secret Vatican briefings. We're going to get into this Ibn al-Arabi and what was really popping around 1200s and who this Muhammad really is. You know, surfing the way. We might as well uh, get it get it all the way real if we're going to do it. Since we're going to talk Messiahs, let's get it. Joseph Atwill's book entitled Caesar's Messiah, the author presents a compelling argument that Christianity Jesus and the Gospels were a creation of Roman political literature penned by the Roman court historian Flavian Josephus. You can get the book of Josephus, man. You know what I'm saying? You get the Antiquity of the Jews in the Drop Library, man. The password is 1234, man. You know, get in while it gets good. Subscribe to the site, man, so you can always have the latest password. They plagiarized the old. Testament laws and prophets. Hmm, you wouldn't say. What else happened? Then they maliciously crafted a turn the cheek. God loves everybody. New Testament Christian doctrine and Messiah called Isus. <laughs> Romans. Rome's motive was to subdue the Hebrews and Gentiles alike after the fall of Jerusalem under the authority of Rome. New world order of today. Perhaps we are victims of the heaviest mental abuse the human mind has ever been asked to bear, believe in the fictional New Testament Gospels. So whatever Mashiach you're rocking with in the New Testament, you're getting it out of pure fiction, which is based on foundational reality. Before the shift of 1053 years in your timeline. Now, I understand why the heathen and the Christian churches of today want the true children of the Most High to abandon their Old Testament prophets, messiahs, laws, and commandments. Roman, Titus, Flavian, Caesar, Josephus gave the biblical Hebrew Israelites their prophetic messiah. Wow. So, you know, Josephus, man, he switched sides, right? And what did he do? He gave you, <laughs> he gave you Esus, man. The fiction of Jesus Christ. See the attached link as a preview to Atwill's well-researched book. Enjoy the wave. It's a tsunami. Shalom, man. The brother dropped it on us, man. Much a hop to Victor Mac. Without further ado, we jumping into it, man. Drop Nation. This ain't no play play. Is he a historical character? Who wrote the Gospels? 
Why are they written in Greek? Why did they have a pro-Roman perspective? Why was the religion headquartered in Rome? Those were the mysteries that I saw about the Gospels. The origin of the Christian religion has been a subject steeped in mystery for nearly 2,000 years. Joseph Atwell is one of a number of scholars today from all around the world who are questioning the historic facts behind these ancient mysteries. When examining the actual history of this era, many of the answers provided by the church and Christian scholars do not hold up to rigorous scrutiny. Mm. This is really important for our culture, to understand where Christianity came from. No doubt, Christians have done a lot of good for the world. But then there are other Christians, often the most dogmatic, who create wars, hatred, and other harm under the disguise of religion. I put it to us in our uh, community terms. My people, my people. It's all love, man. You know what I mean? So when we're trying to like just get back to our creator, hijack free, we're trying to take away anything they brought to us because we know they found us here with a cup of color races found here. And we're trying to sort through the hijack that we know that we was even on, man, that, that opened up, you know what I'm saying, that even capacity for this sorcery to be done on us. So, you know what I'm saying, we're filtering through this hijack. We're filtering through the hijack that was brought to us here. And that's what we're doing. So if this all happened recently and you've been invaded, so-called Negro, then you might need to check the sorcery that's been put on you. And it's on every damn corner in your neighborhood. And it's being pushed to you by people that look like you. Because it's always been, you've always been hijacked by people that look like you. That's fact. Just go back to black ass King James, man. Who came over here with two patents. The London Company and the Plymouth Company. And they both <laughs> colonized with longitude and latitude. The so-called Negro right here in America. We're talking 1606. So then they have the 1611 version coming out of that. After your documents were hijacked here and then remixed and brought back to you with a new test. Your new covenant comes with a new earth. Your new covenant comes with a new earth. You're going to be gathered back together again. You're going to be filled with the pure water. That's prophetic. That's that real spilly air. We trying to get that real spill, man. So, you know, this is real for our people. This ain't no, you know what I'm saying, nothing, you know, disrespect for nobody that's rocking, whatever they're rocking. We're, we're, we're screaming at the top of our lungs, come out of her. Be tribal. Separate. Choose up, vibe up. That's it. No one's saying go go crazy. Go, go. you know what I'm saying, get a pitchfork and, and march into the street. You say, man, separate. You know, figure it out. Be tribal again. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know, research areas around you where you can, you know, kind of fall back, man. Learn how to build a fire. Just just be be around your trees and your mountains again. Good things will happen to you because that's where you're from. Drop all that fear that they put in your head because, you know what I'm saying, you got more to fear being in the grid. You got more to fear being in concrete prisons. And much of Hop to Hop was stew. And the tribe, man, for breaking the spell, man, so that we can walk through a door together, man. So that's what this is all about. We're getting the drop. We are dodging all hijacks. In studying how Christianity emerged, many of our scholars agree that it was used as a political tool to control the masses of the day. And it is still being used this way today. The problem is that Christianity has been used as a tool by government that uses the goodness in people against them. For example, support for the wars in the Middle East has been preached to evangelical Christians as a way to speed up the end of days. This is just one example of the way that propaganda is used to control and manipulate the populace. Actually, according to my study of the ancient texts, the second coming of the Christ has already occurred. Maybe we need to expand the possible answers about how Christianity originated, and deeper questions need to be asked. 
Maybe we need to examine what political motives were behind the formation of the Christian religion. I think it's a requirement of alert citizens to know how the Gospels were written, why they were written, who produced them, what was the purpose and back of all this. This is good citizenry. Everyone should be involved in this. Today, we live on the brink of an immense paradigm shift, and this modern time is very parallel to the era in which Christianity emerged. Studying this ancient era can give us the perspective needed for coming up with solutions to today's problems and for helping create the better world that we envision. The Roman conspiracy to invent Isus, or in other words, to filter. Just think about this, man. These people worship Jupiter and Venus. These people worship Isus, Zeus. This was their main guy back then. Where do you think he went? You think they just stopped worshiping Zeus? That's all they worship. That's all they ever worship. They're not confused about that shit. You're confused. You forgot, you know what I'm saying, who the creator is. You know what I'm saying? You've been hijacked by all these celestial beings, all these celestial hijacks. You just heard them sing about it. They called Jesus the son of Satan, man, in your face, bone. You're confused. They know who they rock with. They know damn clear. They love Jesus. So if your oppressor loves Jesus. And you so-called Negro been invaded and massacred by them. And you love Jesus too. <laughs> then who's following who? They're not following you, fool. They didn't bring this shit to you. I mean, you didn't bring this shit to them. <laughs> They're bringing this shit to you. And these are melanated, man. When you talk Jesus, you're talking Zeus, you're talking Ra, you're talking melanated, angelic, whatever you want to call them. Melanated celestial energies. Melanated, man. This ain't got nothing to do with the white man. This ain't got nothing to do with the white man. You know what the Romans look like, and you know what Zeus looks like, so we're talking the same compilation. Don't let them fuck you up with all this white shit. This ain't got nothing to do with the white man. It's got everything to do with the actual, factual, melanated hijack, celestial hijack that's been hijacking since Atlantean times under the guise of this Thoth, who is Muhammad, under the guise of this Atlantis, which is Egypt, under the guise of Zeus, which is Isus, which is Jesus. This is your celestial hijack. This is Caesar's Messiah, not yours, fool. It's Caesar's for a reason. Get out of her. drop the penny drop that Jesus as a human being never existed the presentation of the Jesus character it's somewhat of a composite of many messianic leaders of the time it's a composite of a particular messianic leader mixed with other ones syncretized with other ones but it's a mixture it's a composite of the real Joshua who had 12 disciples. Well, let's just go back to the drawing board and uh, we'll leave aside all of the assumptions of Christian history. And let's just look at the text afresh and consider every possibility. Let's, uh, let's open the whole game up. Can you think that Christianity is really paganism by a different name? And uh, now it feels completely obvious. Some of us are saying that this was a sun god turned into a Jewish man. <laughs> sun god turned into a Jewish man. Sun god turned into a Jewish man. Sun god turned into a Jewish man. Amen Ra is equivalent of Zeus in Egypt. Zeus is Isus, is Jesus, the man who had to get sacrificed 
but Isus always demands bloody human sacrifice, man. As we open our eyes and our minds, man, the puzzle comes together. In all of this, we're dealing with literature. We're not dealing with history. So the answer is no, there is no um, history to this character of Jesus. It's entirely a literary creation. Some of our Bible scholars are mavericks, working outside the restrictions of mainstream religious institutions. This allows them the freedom to provide fresh insights and draw some startling conclusions about how Christianity was formed. I began reading a number of books on the subject. This turned into a decade-long research. For Joseph Atwell, the key was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Jewish literature ever discovered from the first century AD or CE, the time that Jesus would have been preaching among the Jews. The characters in the Dead Sea Scrolls were militaristic, and you could see that this movement wanted to push the foreigners out of Israel. They were fundamentalists, whereas the characters in the Gospel are different. They are pacifistic. They are turning the other cheek. They're giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. How did a movement like Christianity come to exist in a region that was occupied by Roman soldiers and had Jewish zealots within it that were going to push these Romans out? Or push these so-called Americans out. I mean, how did Christianity, the same question is relevant to you. How does Christianity turn the other cheek, evolve when you come from straight up warrior tribes that have done nothing but resist the hijack? So how is it turn the other cheek? We're all one. We got one guy. It's all good now. Let's move on. We're a melting pot. All this brainwash because they need you. Listen to this shit again, man. Preaching among the Jews. First century A.D. What did we just get? Man, we surfing the wave. I mean, they don't know we happen to have a document up. Called the Medieval Empire of the Israelites. And on page 56, Anatoly Fedomenko also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 A.D., the so-called fundamental shift of 1053 years in the chronology is implied as year one. Let's break the spell. Let's break the code. Let's go. We can do it. We're doing it in real time. We're not getting this from nowhere. All right. No one's pulling our coat. No one's teaching this. Just, we're digging on it in real time together. That's the wave. It's all the probabilities, my people. So 1054 surfed the wave. 1054 is implied as year one in accordance with Christ's birth. Hold that. So year one is really 1054. So you're talking about a different Mashiach. 1,000 years later. Or whatever you want to call this crazy chronology. But that other one didn't exist. So we're just picking up right here. Which makes sense. They're just pretty much pick it, picking up with 1,000. With their time, there is no BC. They're just picking up, really. They're just picking it up. 1054, that's year one. <laughs> now, what are they saying here? Let's get it right. E, the time that Jesus would have been preaching among the Jews. How Christianity was formed. I began reading a number of books on the subject. This turned into a decade-long research. For Joseph Atwell, the key was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay. the only Jewish literature ever discovered from the first century A.D. Or So if these scrolls were discovered in the first century A.D., we're just talking year one. All right, so first century A.D., could they, you know what I'm saying, have really, you know, popped up? Or been written. I mean, we know. Let's back it up again. I want to get this real clear. The 
only Jewish literature ever discovered from the first century AD. Or All right, so it was discovered from the first century, not in the first century. All right, so they're just linking it. They're hypothesizing that this comes from the first century. Again, year one is really 1054 if we're surfing the wave. So the real first century is really happening around 1054. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know what I'm saying? We're talking about the uh, 11th century, 12th century. Now we're going to get back in that Preston John because according to the Preston John drop, the Karyats, you know what I'm saying? He's Wang Kong, emperor of the Karyats, who they're also calling Mongols. But the Karyats are, you know what I'm saying, this, this uh, you know, tribe that's, you know, connected with all the laws of the creator, you know what I'm saying? And they're, they're ruling. He's connected like King David. They keep calling him David. Now you got this letter of Preston John popping up 1165. You know, and according to the Karyats, they had a connection themselves with this Dead Sea Scrolls. They said these Karyats are who left behind the Dead Sea Scrolls. And who's the emperor of the of these Karyats? Priest King, Priest King, Preston John, Priest King, King David, Priest King. So we have a Priest King leading the Karyats, who they say are the connection to the Dead Sea Scrolls. You got this Hawashua with 12 disciples. Already rocking here. You got kids of Kotu. And they're comparing with Christ. We're talking Israel's Messiah. Alright. Now we're saying that this is connected right now. Or CE. The time that Jesus would have been preaching among the Jews. Or Joshua would have been passing the law around this time. So at this 1054. Did the actual Hawashuhua. Joshua, you know what I'm saying, there's all this rocking and now these Dead Sea Scrolls are connected to what's really popping around with this priest king already here, priest king, Kitsukoto is a priest king, Joshua is a priest king, Prester John only means priest king, every time I say Prester John, I'm just saying priest king, Kitsukoto is priest king, we're just talking Kitsukoto, well, they're trying to connect to Jesus Christ. That's how the Mormons did when they came over here. Said, oh, see, he's real. Now we're talking the real Joshua. That's how they hijacked it to bring their Christus, to bring their Isus, to bring their Zeus. And we're just talking year one. We're just talking year one, or is it 1054? The characters in the Dead Sea Scrolls were militaristic uh. and you could see that this movement wanted to push the foreigners out of Israel so these characters were militaristic hmm like the Toltecs who Kitsukoto was leading or Joshua was leading Joshua's slicing and dicing all other hijacks around you including giants they were straight up warriors they were not turning the other cheek they were not taking no hijack man they were only rocking with the creator, man. And these people fear this Mashiach so much, but the foundational legend still had to carry in to their actual lie. Because a lie sounds a lot better when it's mingled with the foundational legend. So they were warriors, according to what was written, you know what I'm saying, what they're calling the Dead Sea Scrolls, as opposed to what? They were fundamentalists. Whereas the characters in the gospel are different. They are pacifistic. So they switched up the Mashiach, switched up the energy so that you can passively accept the invasion. They are turning the other cheek. They're giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. How did a movement like Christianity come to exist in a region that was occupied by Roman soldiers and had Jewish zealots within it that were going to push these Romans out? Convert or die, the same way it happened here. How was that possible? I began studying the other two major works of the era, the New Testament and Wars of the Jews by Josephus, a Roman court historian who described the war between the Romans and the Jews in the first century. While reading these works side by side, I noticed an amazing connection between them. Certain events from the ministry of Jesus seem to closely parallel episodes from the military campaign of Roman Caesar Titus Flavius, 
a campaign which took place 40 years after Jesus supposedly lived. My efforts to understand these connections led me to an incredible discovery. Christianity had been invented by a little-known family of Roman Caesars, the Flavians. And they left us documents to prove it. This is incredible. I'm just surfing the wave. I just had this thought right now, man, in real time. I said, so if this is happening in for real life and for real spill life in 1054, we're talking first century and Flavius is writing, documenting this war that's going on between the Romans and the Jews. Then could that also juxtapo juxtapose here in America around 1054, the you know 11th century, 12th century with the so-called Jews or the Israelites war against these, you know, uh, melanated King James Romans around that time? Are we still talking Jacobite uprising? Are we still talking, you know, saying the war between more or more when we know what the Romans actually look like? We know what King James looked like. We're talking other melanated tribal families jockeying for your land, jockeying for your power. So if Josephus is writing about a war in the first century between Romans and Jews, and that first century is really popping off around the 11th century, then you have to juxtapose. You got to put that into reality, and that's happening right here in America. There's a war going on with the so-called Romans or Esau. Black-ass Esau. And that war been going on. That civil war more and more been popping off right here. So when you look at this Flavia shit, put it right here in the 11th century in America and just see what happens. Surf the wave. Don't just let them take you to 70 AD and play that, you know what I'm saying, chronology bullshit game. You have to put it, you have to juxtapose it right here in America, 11th century, and see how that matches up with the more and more war. The Flavians uh, are not a household name, and yet it's the Flavians who completely reshaped the Roman Empire. In Rome, of course, there's the, there's the Colosseum, which is uh, understood to be the best known monument of the ancient Roman Empire, perhaps. The Colosseum is, in fact, a Flavian construction produced during the Flavian period. It's under the Flavians that both rabbinic Judaism and Christianity take shape. Why would the Flavians be interested in creating religions? Much like today, their era was marked by political power struggles, a bankrupt economy, religious conflicts, and endless wars. In the midst of this turmoil, the Flavians seized control of the Roman Empire and ushered in an immense paradigm shift. To understand the Flavians' rise to power, we need to go back to the reign of the previous powerful rulers, the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Beginning with Julius Caesar in the year 49 BCE, the Julio-Claudians ruled Rome for over a hundred years, transforming the government from a republic into an empire. This family contained all the famous Caesars. Ju now pay attention to these dynasties because this dynasty only rocked for a hundred years. This Claudian, Julio Claudian, only a hundred years. Their dynasties don't last more than 250 years. So if they just did their corporation in 1776, that's their independence day, right? 1776, where they're being independent. They, 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 they got independence from the melanated conquerors over there. Then they come and try to scoop in on you, do treaties. Man, so they just getting their independence. How long is this empire lasting? 250 years. You do the math. Add 250 to 1776. Ball game. Game's up. Gig's up. Their dynasties only last <laughs> no longer than 250 years. This dynasty that's been celebrated right here only lasted 100 years, people. Your captivity is over. Julius, who predated the time of Jesus. Augustus, who was Caesar at the time of Jesus' supposed birth. Tiberius, who ruled during Jesus' supposed death, followed by the infamous Caligula. 
then Claudius, and ending the Julio-Claudian dynasty with Nero, whose reign begins in 54 CE. And dodge all the hijack, because this is all made up shit. All of these, you know, statues and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? You know what Rome looked like. You know what Rome looked like. The Julio-Claudians enjoyed a godlike status until the family degenerated and began to damage the Roman Empire. By the time of Nero, his famous decadence was bankrupting the empire. You see all these melanated people even in the, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the Jews of Judea were staging a huge rebellion against their Roman rulers. Judea was one of the many conquered provinces that made up the Roman Empire. This region, which was also known as Palestine, was controlled by a family that served as Rome's tax collector, the Herods. They were a Greco-Arab family, somewhat possibly Judaized, though... Greco Arab family again. You gotta put it right here in America, 11th century. So who was the tax collector? You know what I'm saying? Who was uh? You know what I'm saying? You know taxing motherfuckers, man. Who was taxing them, man? I mean, where does these Montezumas come into the picture? Where's you know what I'm saying? Who was the tax collectors that was working with the other side? We're talking the Moor or Morocco or the Moab and all these connections that are connected here and there because they want it all they want it all so who were the actual connections happening in the 11th century well only judaized when it was convenient to please the subjects they were given who were put in power in palestine and destroyed the previous jewish ruling family the maccabean family root and stalk besides being heavily taxed and ruled by a non-jewish family put in power by rome the Jews were further inflamed by the requirement that a statue of the Caesar be placed for worship in every temple throughout the empire. In the Roman Empire, you could pretty much have any god you want, but legally you had to submit to the emperor as a god as well. You had to at least acknowledge that the, uh, the Roman leader was also a divine figure. But the Jews would not have any of it. It's fundamental to Jewish belief that you shall make no graven images. It's one of the, the commandments um, mm. given at Sinai um, by God. So the Jews never made representations of God. The Jews had a very different type of religion. They had a religion which was much more focused on the book and less focused upon cultic statues. <laughs> this presented a real problem for the Romans. They tried to install statues of Caesar, but uh, the Jews weren't going to buy that at all. In fact, it aggravated them. It enraged them. And the, the Romans really, I, I think... So these statues should enrage you. ...didn't understand this. It's not statues, it's books. And those books contain what are known as the Jewish messianic prophecies. The thing that most moved the Jews' revolt against Rome was an obscure prophecy from among their writings that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. Holy books inspired the Jews to expect a redeemer who would redeem Israel, rescue Israel, restore Israel to power and leadership in the world. Bang. So when you're talking about your real, true Mashiach, just like Joshua led you on your promised land, you're talking about freedom. Holy books inspired the Jews to expect a redeemer who would redeem Israel, rescue Israel, restore Israel to power. Restore Israel to power. Restore the copper color race found here to power. That is what makes this whole motherfucker shift up, man. That's what makes it all flip upside down when the bottom becomes the top. And that's the prophecy that you'll be put on the bottom. Until you learn to listen and to stop resisting order. And leadership in the world. The Messiah that the literature described was a warrior. The Messiah. Warrior. warrior. The Messiah that the literature described was a warrior. The Messiah that the literature described was a warrior. The Messiahs would have claimed the same attributes that David did. 
David could overcome any army because God gave him the power to do it. So who's in that frequency, people? Who's the warrior in the frequency of King David? Priest King. The Priest King Joshua. The Priest King Quetzalcoatl. Who won the wars. Who won the battles. Who slayed giants just like David. Got you there on your land. Now you rock with something that has never done that for you. Who's made promises, right? That's all Lucifer makes. The Messiah that the literature described was a warrior. The Messiahs would have claimed the same attributes that David did. David could overcome any army because God gave him the power to do it. If you had the power of God, you could easily defeat the Roman army. Joshua. Choose the up. people rebelled against Rome and were led by a messianic movement that had a series of messiahs that had come forward to fight against the Roman Empire. The Hebrew word messiah is translated into Greek as Christos mm. or Christ. So the title of Christ can describe any of the numerous messiahs of this movement. Mm. Yes, the word Christ or Christians can uh, refer to the Palestine messianic movement. Um, but it's a later term. It's a later reformulation of the Messianic movement in Palestine. It's a later reformulation. It's a later formation. It's a hijack city. This movement rebels against Rome in 66 and is successful. It actually defeats them militarily. So it must have been a huge movement. The victorious Jews set up a nation state directly in the Roman Empire. And the Romans had to do something about it. There was a real danger that this messianic movement could not only boil over in Judea itself, but could spread to other Jewish communities and other parts of the Roman Empire. Rome ruled its colonies with a rod of iron, and any resistance was going to be met with brute force. At this time during Nero's reign, two of the finest military men in the empire were the Flavians, Vespasian and his son Titus. Vespasian and Titus were military men. They spent a great deal of their life outside of Rome. For over a decade, they had waged war against the Druids in Brittany and Gaul. Vespasian and Titus were successful in essentially destroying the Druids. They left behind no historical record of their existence. And it's the Flavians that Nero calls upon when he needs to suppress the Jews' rebellion in Judea. Nero responded by asking his best general, Vespasian, and his son Titus to go into Judea with a huge army, 60, 70,000 troops, and a similar number of support individuals. So they meant business. The Romans came down to crush the rebellion. In the year 66 CE, the Flavians begin their military campaign against the Jews. They start further north in Galilee, where the first of three key events takes place. They destroy the Jewish towns of Galilee. They also capture a Jewish rebel who later becomes a critical figure in the formulation of Christianity. This is where they captured one of the leaders of the rebellion, a Jew named Josephus Bar Matthias. Now, Josephus presented himself to the Flavians as a prophet. He survived. He survived apparently by telling Vespasian that the prophecies of the Jews pointed out that Vespasian would become emperor. And of course he did, so Vespasian quite liked Josephus. He used him as a translator in his entourage. He used him to appeal to the rebels to surrender. At this point, Josephus became a turncoat and worked with the Flavians against the rebellion. Meanwhile, chaos is increasing back in Rome, where Nero's rule is being threatened. In the year 68, the Senate found the courage to depose Nero, and he committed suicide. Now, in that circumstance, Vespasian was a prime candidate to become emperor. In the middle of this war, Vespasian returned to Rome and seized the throne. The Flavians then became the imperial family. With Vespasian becoming the new Caesar in Rome, 
Titus stays behind on the battlefield and sets his sights on Jerusalem, where the other two key events take place. Titus encircles Jerusalem with a wall, and finally he raises the temple, leaving not one stone atop another. It took a while. They eventually had to bring on starvation by building a wall, a barricade entirely enveloping the city. What happens, of course, is the temple in 70 is completely destroyed. For the Jews, it was the old... How many of your temples here was destroyed around the 11th century, 12th century? What was this Genghis Khan takeover all about? Genghis Khan against Prester John, no Khan and Khan. One Khan hijacking the Khan, the Khan. One hijacking the Khan, so this is the 12th century. How does this play with gang? You know what I mean? All this stuff, just like we got with the Antonio for the Manco. All of these are duplicates and phantoms of history. Different kings, you know what I'm saying? Same king with a different name that they placed in different places. This really happened. They gave them different names, put them in different places, dropped them off 333 years, 10,053 years, 1,800 years. You know what I mean? So that is the actual formation of things, man. This is what really popped off. So what time is it? All that, you know, you got to fall back on all that. <laughs> Put the babies together and just know that it ain't the time they tell you. And if it ain't the time they tell you, then you're more than welcome to surf the way. Ultimate calamity because, of course, this was the house of their God and it was destroyed by the Romans quite thoroughly. Titus, of course, was the victor of this great siege. Titus carried the spoils of this captured city back to Rome for his triumph. He took the treasures of the temple, their famous seven branch candlestick, but you can see it on the arch of Titus in Rome. It celebrates that tremendous victory of Rome again triumphant and Titus of course is the hero of the day. All of the artifacts from the temple that they seized, they put on public display in what they refer to as the Palace of Peace, except for one item. The Jewish scripture, Josephus records that the Flavians took and placed in their private palace where no one was allowed to see it. Although Titus Flavius successfully ended the rebellion in Judea, Another rebellion soon broke out in Alexandria, Egypt. The Flavians were clear that this was not the end of the Jewish Messianic movement. They also recognized that it was the Jews' Messianic literature that was fueling this movement. So it was the frequency, it was the word. Once they captured the Jewish scripture, they had all other copies of it destroyed. And that's why the Dead Sea Scrolls had to have been buried in a cave because that was the only way they could be safe from the Roman destruction. There was not a single scrap of literature found from the Messianic movement until the scrolls were discovered. That's why they're such a treasure, because they're the only real voice of the Messianic movement that we have. And the real voice of the Jews' Messianic movement, according to our scholars, was violent and militaristic, not the pacifistic version depicted in the Gospels. Military. War against Rome was a messianic war. So that's why I say that the scrolls are not only the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine, they're also the literature of the war against Rome. The Romans needed to subdue the Jews' religion, so they set about influencing it and changing it. They realize I can't destroy the Jewish religion altogether. That's not their objective. They realize they're sensible enough to realize that they can't do that. Mm. So what you have to do is try to create a type of Judaism that is benign. Mm. And it's exactly coinciding with the rise of the Flavian dynasty is the arrival of two benign forms of Jewish ideology. So, out pops Judaism and Christianity, which are both forms of, you know what I'm saying, just the ancient, you know, I mean, you know, they call it Jewish and Judaism, the study of Judah, Hawauda. These are the laws of your creator. This is how you rock. So they took your law, blasted it apart, 
put their spin, put their King James 1606, you know what I'm saying, sorcery spin on it, gave it back to you, repackaged in Christianity, Judaism, and we'll get, you know what I'm saying, hopefully we'll get some time in this series, or this, uh, this, uh, you know, joint right here, but definitely in the series, man, we'll get to the creation as this links to the Vatican and, you know, this Islam, Muhammad, Muhammadan connection and how that links to the timelines as well. So all this is coming out the Vatican, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Bang, bang, bang. You have a trinity. All in, what's the, uh, you know what I'm saying? What's the comparison? Yeah. It's all in the energy, you know what I mean? In Christianity, they don't care about the tribe. They care about, oh, I believe in this thing and this thing, and we all believe in that thing. Judaism, they don't care about the real tribe. They make a duplicate phantom tribe with the foundational legend, you know what I'm saying, of the real thing. But they just use an abstract version and call it the study of isms, the ism of Judah, the ism of Judah. And this is the Christ, the Mashiach, the Messianic, the Mashiach, the Joshua Anity. The Joshua Anity. And they blast that apart. All right. Then they give you the the whole, you know, Ishmael, Ishmaelite, you know, doctrine. And you as a Hebrew have never had a prophet or a leader that was not an Israelite. You never were given someone outside of your tribe to lead you. So they tell you to follow Ishmael now, right? Follow the Ishmaelites, right? All this is sprouting at the same damn time with the same damn spell in different places from the same source. It's during this period that a new literature enters history, which describes a peace-loving, turn-the-other-cheek preaching Jewish Messiah uh -oh. named Jesus Christ. Jesus! Zeus! But if the Flavians wrote the Gospels, how could a Roman family know how to write Jewish literature that refers to Jewish prophecy? The answer lies in the Flavians' collaborations with a number of Jewish intellectuals, beginning with their own court historian, Josephus. Josephus arrives back in Rome with Titus. He becomes an adopted member of the Flavian family. An amazing turn of events for the Jewish turncoat. He becomes Flavius Josephus. Josephus at this time begins writing the history of the war. And he records that Titus gave him the Jewish scripture. Josephus' histories have always been associated with the origins of Christianity. Time and again, you can find parallels between what Josephus writes and what turns up in the Gospels. It's a powerful evidence of their true origin. In reading the works of Josephus side by side with the Gospels, scholars have noticed parallels between the two works. It appears as though the history of Josephus records events that fulfill the prophecies of the Old and New Testaments. Listen up. Early Christians understood this connection. In fact, when the Bible first began to be printed in the Middle Ages, it included the history of Josephus. Mm. He was employed to write the official history that we have. The other histories from this period have been destroyed ruthlessly by the Romans. Josephus tells us this in very chilling passages, how the Romans exerted complete control of the literature of this period. There were alternative histories of the Jewish war written. Well, the Romans rounded up the writers of those histories and executed them. They rounded up all the copies of those histories mm. and destroyed them. That is to say, they ruthlessly wiped out any alternative history so that the only history we have is written by Josephus. And let's Wow, so they wiped it all out and filtered it through one vein. And my brother and sister today, you have to question at least a little bit. If it's all coming out of one vein and they're all, all alternatives destroyed. If all this effort and energy was put into hiding something, then you should at least enjoy asking questions as to what's being hidden what was transposed and juxtaposed on me. What is the real Mashiach? Why is there two Joshua's? Why do they both have 12 disciples? <laughs> and why is it all being connected right here with the copper color races in America? Exactly. 
exerted complete control of the literature of this period. There were alternative histories of the Jewish war written. Well, the Romans rounded up the writers of those histories and executed them. Mm. They rounded up all the copies of those histories and destroyed them. Right. That is to say, they ruthlessly wiped out any alternative history so that the only history we have is written by Josephus. And let's remember who Josephus was chief propagandist of the, the Flavian dynasty, and he was very, very successful. He moved back to Rome, he was given a, uh, an apartment in the emperor's own townhouse, mm. and he was appointed the chronicler of the Roman Jewish war using Vespasian's own diaries of the events. Also in the pages of his history, Josephus declares that the Jews Messiah or Christ is none other than Flavius Vespasian mm. and his dynastic family. To put it succinctly, Josephus says... <laughs> so that's their real Mashiach? That's their man? That there was a prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. The Jews thought this applied to one of their own. They were wrong in their interpretations. He used the most cynical interpretation. He applied it to the rise of the Roman emperor in Palestine. Josephus recorded that the Messianic prophecies foresaw not a Jew, but Vespasian and his dynasty. In fact, all of the Flavian historians recorded that the Flavian Caesar was the Christ. It was important to the Flavians that they be seen as the Christ, as divine and godlike. And this was not mere vanity. The Julio-Claudians before them had already established that presenting themselves as gods was a powerful tool in controlling their subjects. Presenting themselves as gods was a powerful tool in controlling you so-called Negroes today. So you worship them through Christianity because you have their image embedded in your ablangada, in your psyche, in your energy, you have their image. And that's why they go so hard with their images and what do they do now on television and movies? Oh, they turn it way up. We're talking about the invention of Jesus. Man, when you get in that drop library, man, you can pull this up. The true authorship of the New Test. All right. Get all that in the library, man. Get all that in the library. Keep digging on it, man. Keep loving it. I also got this link up here, man, just for y'all, man. Who want to drop that drop? Share, you know, support your drop library by dropping the PDFs below the Wada. So you can click this link, man. I got the special little algorithm that links this directly to my Google Drive. So when you click this right here, bang, bang. She even got feathers. She even got feathers. <laughs> Google Dropbox, man. You can actually drop me any files, music, all that direct. So, you know, if you're doing the vibe, uh, Drop tuna package, you can drop your songs like that. You know what I'm saying? If you're doing the free five songs a month that we tune in for three two, you can do it right there. Get all that, man. Drop your PDFs right there. We just in the library, man. Pull it up. The authorship of the New Testament. We're talking Arius, Calpurnius, Piso, pen name, Flavius, Josephus, the author of the New Testament. Arius Piso, Flavius Josephus. Let's just get a little bit of this. We'll come back to it, man. We'll, you know, we'll do at least a part two on this. Complimentary. We, why we welcome you to the inner circle. The inner circle or inner ring is the most exclusive club in history or has consisted of these religious, political, and literary leaders having knowledge of the great secret that the Copernican Piso family of ancient Rome created the fictional Jesus. So we're getting it from multiple substantiating docs, the New Testament, the church, and Christianity. So Copernicus, Copernicus Piso, we're talking Flavius, pen name Flavius, pen name, what else? Paul, Paul of your New Testament, pen name Flavius, pen name Calpurnius Piso of ancient Rome created fictional Jesus, Jesus, Zeus. The New Testament, the church, and Christianity. 
in welcoming the general public to this knowledge, the following introduction is appropriate. Originally, the explanation was designed solely for Jews for the purpose of preventing their perversion to Christianity. It was not intended for Christians nor other non-Jews. No exclusivism was intended, rather concern for the faith of others. The purpose of this booklet was to inform Jewish Christians and Jewish Jews of the true account of the cre creation of Christianity in the first century A.D., or the 1100s, or 1053-54, Jews were 10% of the population of the Roman Empire today, about 1900 years of suffering, persecution, forced conversion, exile, murder, finally the Holocaust, right, so we dodged the hijack, the Jews are, but all right, so let's get this right here, man, you already see where they're going, you know, they're not talking about the Israelites, right? But yeah, here's the table of context, man. You can, you know, dig on that. The great secret. The Jews reject the story, man. Some great drop in here. Get it out the library. We're talking about the great secret. The New Testament, the church, and Christianity were all the creation of Calpurnius Peso, pronounced Peso. Peso. Just like the Mexican Peso. So what are we talking about here, my people? How does this connect to America and Mexico? If we're just talking Peso. Pesos, man. The Peso family were who were Roman aristocrats. The New Testament and all the characters in it. Jesus, all the Josephs, all the Marys and disciples, apostles, Paul and John the Baptist are all fictional. <laughs> I can't make this shit up. Man. All fictional, man. Can we get a baby? All fictional. The Pesos created the story and the characters. They tied the story into a specific time and place in history, and they connected it with some peripheral, actual people. Hmm. The foundation of legends, such as Herod's Gamaliel, the Roman procur procurators, etc. But Jesus and everyone involved with him were created. That is, fictional characters in the middle of the first century, the present era, Romans aristocracy felt itself confronted with a growing problem. The Israelite uh, religion was growing, was continuing to grow in numbers, adding more, even more proselytes. Jews numbered more than eight, eight million and were 10 percent of the population of the empire, 20 percent of the portion living in Rome. Approximately half or more of the Jews lived outside Palestine. Many were descended. Right, let's get to the good stuff, man. Let's get to the good stuff. So the Roman author. And Aeneas Seneca, tutor, tutor, we're talking about the Tudor family and confidant Emperor Nero. Here comes the Nero, suggesting a letter to his friend Luc Luc Lucilius, a pseudonym of Lucius Piso or Peso, that lighting candles on Sabbaths be prohibited. Seneca is later quoted by St. Augustine in his City of God. All right, we also got a City of God in Brazil. Let's go. Although the quotation does not exist in Seneca's extant writings as charging that the Sabbath customs of that most accursed nation have gained such strength. So they called you a cursed so-called Negro. They said your Sabbath customs of the most accursed, cursed nation, so-called Negro, have gained such strength that they have been now received in all lands, these Sabbath customs have gained such strength that they have been received in all lands. The conquered have given laws to the conqueror. The conquered Negro have given laws to the conqueror. Because of your strength of your Shabbat, keep your Shabbat because it gives you strength. The family headed by Seneca's family, Lucius Pisa, was confronted with an alien problem more personal to it. They were the Calpurnius Pisos, who were descended from statesmen and consuls and from great poets and historians as well. Gaius Lucius Calpurnius Piso, the leader of the family, had married Aria, the younger, from her grandfather's Aristobulus. This, this made Lucius Piso's wife the great-granddaughter of Harold the Great. Man, so we're just getting an intro to this, but you already see where it's coming from. The Copernicus Peace Soul. We're talking Josephus. He said, a new world and everything in it. 
All this stuff is all fictional. Josephs, the Marys, the Jesus, all these apostles and Pauls and all that, man. And in part two, we'll get into the creation of the Prophet Muhammad. And now this connects, man, with this article by Alberto Rivera talking about, you know what I'm saying, this Prophet man popping up and how it was a creation and how it now ties to Ibn al-Arabi who actually popped up in 1200s and how this is the real Muhammad that's popping up again in the 1200s which is talking about the chronology 1054 1053 1054 AD is implied as year one in accordance with the Christ or the Mashiach or Hawashua or Joshua or Kitsukooto man so we talk Zeus and we're talking Isus and when we know what they're singing Christ is your son. That's when we dodge the hijack, man. We're going to get this too, man. This Jesus Lucifer. I forgot who dropped this on me, man. But love to you, man. We'll get this in part two. And uh, yeah, definitely, man. We'll keep this war. You know what I'm we'll keep doing our war chant, man. We'll keep war chanting it up, man. As we get it, man. As we get it, as we get it. <sighs> Defaming the Messiah. Defaming the Messiah. Defaming the Mashiach, defaming the Mashiach. Choose your Joshua and choose up. Love the Drop Nation and all y'all surfing the wave, man. We just digging on it. Thank y'all for digging with us. Stay up, suit up, choose up.